So I ask, and this book asks, the question from North Africa more broadly. How do scholars of the Holocaust, with a focus on the Jews, reclaim memory? How can one be diverse and also as inclusive as possible? How can one move from European-centric ideas and Holocaust studies to embrace the North African story? In short, how can we become more holistic? We are all well informed of the historical events. Germans, French, Italians occupied North Africa that the Maghreb was home to a large, vibrant Jewish population, about a half a million strong. Many indigenous to the region pre the Islamic period. Pre World War II, Jews of Algeria were citizens of France. In Morocco and Judea and Tunisia and Libya, they were colonial subjects. Some lived in the Kasbah, the Mela, the Hara, some in cosmopolitan new suburbs. If in big cities like Casablanca, Tripoli, Tunis, they were socialized with waves of modernization and became the leading edge of cultural and social change. When the Holocaust came, Algerian Jews became stateless overnight. In Morocco and Tunisia, the Vichy government were all too willing to remain impassive when anti-Semitism reared its head and Muslims targeted Jewish property and businesses. Barred from many sectors of the economy, quotas became the method to employ Jews in most sectors of the economy. In 1940, Vichy authorities established penal labor and internment camps across the Maghreb and Sahara. In Italy ruled Libya, these patterns were similar. So what is this book about in part? And what is Safari Voices about? It's an audiovisual digital archive that collects the stories the photos and documents of individuals who became refugees fleeing their ancestral homelands in the Middle East and North Africa and Iran following the founding of the State of Israel. State sanctioned discriminations, violence, and political unrest brought an abrupt end to these historic communities, scattering their members to the four corners of the earth. Our book, Safari Voices, and I'll just hold up the book. The Untold Expulsion of Jews from Arab Lands is a window into the experience of these communities and their stories of survival. Begun in 1905, the project has collected 450 interviews from 10 countries, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Tigris and Euphrates. Some of the Safari Voice collection are available today at the National Library of Israel. Um, you can go look under the Shasha collection, uh, which is uh, audio uh, interviews, and you can look under the Victor and Edna Mashal collection, um, which, uh, uh, Collects, collected the interviews of those people who settled in Canada. Um, in this book, uh, sorry, not this book, but uh, I don't have it here, but in the recent, uh, where is it this book? Sorry, trying to remember which one it is. Um, I'm not sure, I think it's, uh, anyhow, it's Almut Lay has commented the digital archives are a growing trend of oral history interviews and will redefine the playing field. Recording the interviews visually not only 
by analog audio recordings will lead to many new possibilities of using techniques and tools to organize and find data in the digital age. And Safari Voices is really on the cutting edge of this. The Safari Voices collection includes a few stories, not many, of individuals who were victims of the Holocaust. And so today I'm going to show you uh, uh, through video one of these and talk about a few others. Susan Silliman in her article in uh, this book talks of paradigms and addresses the concept of inclusion with diversity. And she talks about how it's different than Michael Rothberg's idea of multi-directional memory. What does Rothberg say? He talks about multi-directional memory as the productive and dynamic interaction of different historical memories. But Solomon actually goes a bit different. She says it's more focused on how it is to be remembered. And so I just want to read a little bit of what she says. Technically, only someone who was there can remember an event as part of personal memory. But it makes a huge difference whether one was a young child, an adolescent, or a mature adult at the time. I have formulated the concept of the 1.5 generation to take account of the way a child, of the way child survivors have negotiated issues of trauma and memory. I'm not quite sure about this 1.5, but the point is though that memory in itself is diverse. It's fluid. It changes. And if you combine this with other kinds of variables as a social scientist, age, gender, rural, urban, religious, secular, educated, uneducated, what language do you speak? French, Italian, Spanish, Arabic, Ladino, Akatia. Were you interned or not interned? Did you lose a family member or did you not lose a family member? All these variables punctuate the diversity that we have to pay attention to. Or memory, as Sharon Kassinger Cohen discusses in a recent article in the Journal of the Israel Oral History Association. She addresses it in a different kind of way. The child survivor reflects on the physical and emotional struggle of the parents. They recall critical moments, but as they age, the perceptions change and the experiences in the passage of time create new kinds of perspectives. She challenges those who question the validity of children's memories. Different periods in time create, I would argue, new hermeneutics that will lead over time from a social science perspective, if you have enough interviews, I think, to, to, to new emerging patterns. And if you combine that with what's happening in the digital world of what we can do in terms of the archives, I think that we're going to see something over the next decade that is totally different. So even here at the, uh, uh, at the Ben Spee Institute, people like Haim Sadun, by raising the public and educational awareness of the lesser known stories of the Maghreb brings a different understanding in terms of memory and exclusiveness. So I want to uh, begin by just showing you a little bit of what Safari Voices is about. And I have a little video here that uh, will give you a little sense of what Safari Voices is about. Thank you. 
Ça va. Euh, merci. בתור יהודי שחי במדינה ערבית, תמיד שמרנו על פרופיל נמוך. היינו אזרחים מסוג ג' וד'. שם הכל נשאר, כל הכסף נשאר בבנק, האדמות שלנו, רכוש, הכל נשאר. I feel my past is a total void because when the Jews left Egypt, when they were expelled, they were scattered around the world. I am a refugee. Yes, I'm a refugee. They kicked me out with all my family, with nothing, nothing. עזבו הכל מאחור. אני מכיר את היישוב איפה שאני גרתי, הרי הייתי בגיל צעיר מאוד, אבל אני יודע שעזבו הכל, הכל. On est tous des réfugiés des pays arabes, on est un million, et il faut se battre pour ça. Il faut continuer à... Quand on reconnaît notre cause, qu'on a été expulsé d'un pays qu'on ne voulait pas quitter. On ne voulait pas quitter, on nous a expulsé. Si j'ai gagné Israël, il y a eu un caché. J'ai eu un caché de l'Eva, sans amis, sans amis. Je n'ai pas été mis à la maison. במחנה הפליטים, כל בוקר תור ארוך, עם בלי מתכת, לקחת דייסה לאוכל. אחרי שיש לי אזרחות ישראלית, אני מרגיש פליט. אם ספרד צריך להצליח, הוא צריך להיות טוק 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 על מנת להצליח, טוק טוק. אחרת, אם אתה לא טוק, אתה נבלם באיזשהו מקום. עלינו מתוך כמיהה, מתוך אמונה, עזבנו את הכל ואמרנו, יהיה מה שיהיה, אנחנו נגיע לארץ. in our collection, Holocaust is mentioned. And there's three child survivors. And it very much deals with memory, diversity, and inclusiveness because the three have different stories and have different historical experiences in terms of the countries they come from. So the first one is Moshe Lavi. Uh, Moshe Lavi was born in uh, Benghazi, Libya in 1932. His ancestors go back to the Iber uh, Iberian ex uh, uh, Peninsula, expelled in 1492. His, um, his very famous ancestor was Rabbi Shimon Lavi, who um, I'm sure more, a lot of you know, uh, 
created the uh, piyut uh, uh, um, in which uh, is sung, uh, you know, on uh, before uh, dinner uh, on Shabbat, and is sung on uh, Lagba Omer. And what was his story? He's setting out after uh, uh, he leaves uh, the Iberian Peninsula, he goes to Morocco, and he gets kidnapped along the way. He then gets ransomed, and he ends up in Libya, and he says, there's nothing here. I need to build Jewish institutions. And so this is a family that's been there for 500 years. Okay? On his mother's side, just amazing. On his mother's side, who is the ancestor? It's Rabbi Israel Salanter. Who is Israel Salanter? He's the founder of the Musar movement. Can you imagine? On both sides, okay? 500 years of the history in Libya. And so what happens with him? The war breaks out. His best friends, his father's best friends, all of a sudden see the family as an enemy. His father is taken to a concentration camp in Zwitina, in Libya, in 1940. Then the British come. And then the Germans come. And so he says, well, here, let's watch the video. Labi. I was born in Benghazi, Libya. The Italians were pretty well oriented toward the Jewish population until the racial laws that started in 1937-38. As a child I realized for the first time that I was different than the others and um, it was uncomfortable but you perceived that something was different. Rommel landed in Tripolitania and he advanced with his forces. He repelled the British and there was a program. The Italian population came out with all their anger toward the Jews. They looted all the stores of the Jews. The program was taking care of the street. We were children in the house. We barricaded the doors, scared to death that something would happen to us. But the British came up again and they were able to repel Rommel. This time we did not stay. This time we just decided that we have to go with them. We boarded the ship and we were taken to Alexandria, Egypt. We didn't have suitcases, we didn't have anything. Just uh, We left with our clothing. One thing we had was the jewelry that my father was able to, he, he was able to, he had a a can that was for oil. And I don't know how he did it, but he put everything in. So this can was the only belonging. So here we are now in Shkunata Tikva, in a house where the toilet is outside, outdoors. Again, it's better than anything we had until then. And we go to school there are no school buses, we cannot afford to pay the bus fare, so we walk to school. And my teacher one day asked me, don't you feel cold? I was wearing only a shirt. Only then I realized that I felt cold, but we couldn't afford to have a jacket. There is a stage in your life when you start to realize, in, maybe it's when you, it's during the, downhill phase that you realize, wait a minute, there is a lot in you that belongs to the past and, and you have to go back there. If you want to be what you are, you better look at that. And so,
Moshe Levi is going back to his past and he's trying to understand one of the things that very much changed. And he says, as a child, your father is the image of a strong man, the one who can do anything. You grow up, you change your mind. But at that time in 1940, I remember him as strong. But when he came back from the camp, after the British forces dislodged the Italian army, he had pain. I will never forget. He was talking to an Arab in a slightly different tone. He was different than the way he would talk to a Jew. It left an imprint on my memory. So how he sees his parents, how he sees his life as time continues, is continually changing. It's fluid. Charles Deand is from Algeria. He was born in 1939 in the Casbah. His neighbors were Arab. The toilets were collective. His father was taken by the Germans when he was very, very young and returned when he was six years old. So let me just read this little section of the book. He says, Emile, my father, was born into grinding poverty in Algiers during World War II. He grew up in the Kasbah, where his neighbors were overwhelmingly Arabs and Jews. He lived with his family in a tiny apartment with toilets, without toilets, running water, or electricity. Rats scurried up and down the staircase. He felt so strongly that he belonged to France that he joined a French regiment in 1939 to fight the Germans. He and his fellow soldiers were captured almost immediately and interned in a prisoner of war camp in Germany. He had never told anyone that he was Jewish. When German officers came through the camp, they saw him without clothes and noticed that he was circumcised. The French officer swore to the Germans on his honor as an officer that he was not Jewish. They accepted his word and he led. His wife, Emile's wife, had seven kids to take care of. Two died while he was away. One, because they just didn't have enough food to feed her. He says that he himself, at the age of five, had a fever of 42. And they prayed, and he lived. He lived in fear while his siblings died. In the interview, he says, this is the first time I've ever told my stories. The last one I would just want to briefly mention is Walter Arbi. He also comes from Libya, but as the Italians are coming, his parents escape and they go to Tunis. And he is born in Tripoli, sorry, in Tunis in 1941. He only comes back in 1944. And he says, I remember we went back to our house. It was used by the Germans as one of their headquarters. And all I thought about was, was I ever lucky? I was in Tunisia. And then he says, my uncle said to me, he said, they also came for us in Tunisia. They came into the house. And my uncle said, we are British citizens. You cannot touch us. And for some reason, they left and our skin was saved. So these are just three short examples that bring together different stories from children who experienced the Holocaust 
in Tunisia, in Libya, and how these stories can add to our memory, how it can be more inclusive, and how in particular it can make our understanding of the Holocaust much more holistic. So, so I'm going to pass it on to Richard, who will continue. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Richard Sturzberg, I'm the co uh, author of the very fine book of Henry. But I'm not going to talk about uh, the Holocaust, I'm going to talk about the current moment. And uh, I just would like to say a couple of things. First of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the Ben Zvi Institute, particularly with respect to its focus on uh, the study of Jewish community in the East. And I know that you have spent a lot of time uh, working very hard to uh, deal with Holocaust denial in the Muslim world. Um, this question of uh, my talk are using the three sort of themes that Henry touched on memory, diversity, and inclusiveness. Uh, this book is called The Untold, The Untold Expulsion of Jews from Arab Lands. Everyone is familiar with the Palestinian expulsions and the Palestinian refugee issue. But uh, I think it's fair to say that almost nobody except certain experts actually know about the expulsion of almost a million Jews from North Africa. The uh, with the exception now, recently, of Morocco, the Arab governments have spent their time trying to pretend that there were no Jews. And to the extent that the heritage of the Jews is there, that it gets eliminated. It's very interesting. Uh, one of the things that was most striking to me is when the the great synagogue in uh, Alexandria was uh, refurbished by the Egyptian government. They invited uh, all the many of the Egyptian Jews who, in fact, had to flee Egypt to come back to the see the refurbishment of the synagogue. But and about two hundred people showed up to see the refurbishment of the synagogue. But the Egyptian government never told the Egyptians themselves. They had done this, and it was done purely for the purposes of international consumption. The uh, the attention to the question of this gigantic uh, expulsion, even in major organizations like the United Nations, is essentially non-existent. So since nineteen. It's probably a more interesting talk. So, so since, I've been enormously struck by the fact that since 1947, the UN has passed over 800 resolutions concerning the conflict between Israel and the Arab nations. None mention, none mention the expulsion of Sephardi Jews from North Africa. When the UN Relief and Works Agency was set up to deal with the Palestinian refugees in 1948, it's still in operation. It got $600 million a year to continue its work. But of course, nothing was ever done for the <coughs> close to a million Sephardi Jews who were themselves exposed. Now, as this, so we find ourselves in a circumstance where this enormous uh, human rights crisis is essentially unknown. It's essentially unknown. And as this generation of people die off, unless their stories and their experiences and their memories are recorded and maintained, 
then it will be forgotten forever. Now, when things are forgotten, of course, that's a disaster. That means that, in fact, there can be no truth going forward. One person <laughs> we didn't start with many. <laughs> Just to pick up by Henry's other theme, the theme of diversity. Um, just to close on the Sephardi Archive, Voices of Archive, Sephardi Voices of Archive is, in fact, the memories of these people. Preserved now, uh, we hope, in perpetuity. In terms of diversity, I just would like to make a couple of observations. You know, we think about this uh, expulsion essentially from the point of view of the people who were themselves expelled. And certainly it was a catastrophe for those people. But it was a different kind of catastrophe as well. It was a catastrophe for the countries that expelled them. Um, and I mean this in two different senses. One is that they lost a lot of people who were fundamental uh, to the social, cultural, and economic structures of those countries. And what the other countries that took them in received as a result was in many cases, extraordinarily gifted people. I make a little list of that. We should um, think of us if you can um, talk louder. Talk louder? Yeah. I'll do my best to talk louder. Yeah. Um, the kind of people that, uh, that were in fact, born and then later had to leave, include uh, Nobel Prize winners in physics, at least two of them. Even Bernard Henri Lévy, the probably the foremost French public intellectual, Jacques Derrida, Andre Asselman, who was from Egypt and who will recall the author of Call Me By Your Name, Giselle Halini from Tunisia who chaired the international panel that was set up by Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre to look into American war crimes in Vietnam. The list goes on and on and on. But more importantly, I think, even in the individuals that were no longer available to these countries, the Arab countries lost diversity. And when you lose diversity, what happens is that uh, you lose innovation. You lose the distinct voices around the table that allow you to make better outcomes. And this is true of business, we know it to be true of science, we know it to be politics and culture. And when you have sort of monocultures without diversity, it leads you into small dead ends. Diversity also promotes tolerance, as we know. The places where Jews are most hated, by and large, are the places where there are no Jews. The places where Black people are most despised is often places where there are no Black. I'll tell you a little anecdote from my own country. In Canada, um, there's a, in certain parts of English Canada, there's intense anti-French feeling, and in certain parts of Canada, intense anti-English feeling. The parts of Canada where the anti-French feeling is strongest is, the, is where there are no French-speaking people. I can remember I was at a, at a dinner dans le Québec profond, which is in, a, in Quebec, in the darkest parts of Quebec. And they started in a dinner about the mode Zion, the, the damned English. And that's what they were going on for, but I said, wait a minute, you know, I'm English. They said, yes, but you're, you're all right. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 this won't do. And of course, where the biggest anti-English and the most profound separatist feeling was, was all the parts of French Canada where nobody had heard a word of English from one generation. I think that uh, there's uh, the people obviously who were displaced struggle, but it may not be unreasonable to ask, and I just want to give you a little quote from the, from the book. Um, what would the Arab countries have been like if the Jews had stayed. Um, just a, an example uh, from, this is really from Baghdad. And Baghdad, as you know, uh, was before the expulsion, 
somewhere between a third and 40% Jewish. And uh, in fact, on Shabbat, the entire place stopped. All the, the Muslims stopped doing business because nobody could do any of this and nobody wanted to do any of this. This is a little quote. This is an interesting thing. It's in the book by a guy uh, called Dia Kasim Kashi, who was a Muslim who was born in Baghdad in Iraq and ultimately uh, emigrated to Britain. And he makes this observation. Um, uh, Dia recalls, quote, business across the country used to shut down on Shabbat, uh, on Saturday because it was Jewish Shabbat. They were the most prominent members of every elite profession, bankers, doctors, lawyers, professors, engineers, as well as all of Iraq's famous musicians and composers. The country suffered a big shock when the Jews left. It's difficult to imagine any country being able to sustain the loss of many of its best educated and most successful citizens. If this had not happened, what would have Iraq been like? It would have retained its diversity and it would have retained many of its most gifted people. I just touch on one last theme, which is really the theme of inclusiveness. Um, I'm uh, the fact that nobody knows about uh, these expulsions. Uh, I think is uh, I think is troubling uh, because you know to quote uh, George Santayana, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. It's as though people who don't know about the Holocaust, this is a dangerous matter. I think it's time now that uh, the Arab countries need to come to grips with what happened in terms of these expulsions. And there are models for doing this. Um, you know, the Germans, to their credit, have done a very good job over the course of the last many decades to come to grips with Nazis and to come to grips with what the country did. And they have made it their business to ensure that the truth of what happened in Germany is known. The same thing happened in South Africa at the end of apartheid, you may recall that they set up the Truth and the Reconciliation Commission under Bishop Tutu, and they made it their business for everybody in South Africa to understand the truth of what had taken place. In Canada, in my own country, we have had an appalling relationship with the indigenous people of the country. Uh, we attempted to basically exterminate their culture utterly. And there was a whole horror where children were taken from their parents at very young ages, sometimes four or five, and put into residential schools where they were forbidden to speak their languages and where they wanted to turn them into. These schools were such a catastrophe that it's only now that we were beginning to come to grips with the number of children that were murdered in schools. But the uh, same thing, there was a sort of commission that was set up to deal with, also it was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, to make sure that Canadians understood the truth of what it is that their country had done to the indigenous <clears throat> people. The, uh, I think that now is, is the time, I think it's now is the time for the, if there's ever gonna be any reconciliation um, between uh, the Jews and the Arab countries, that the Arab countries have to in themselves engage in the same form and the same process. And this will require an absolute sea change in attitudes. As I mentioned, you know, the mosque in uh, the mosque in Alexandria is a kind of Potemkin mosque. It's a mosque that is unknown to the uh, the Muslims in Egypt. It's unknown that it was being tried to refurbish. Hmm? The synagogue. The synagogue. The, sorry, the synagogue. Yeah. Well, even the mosque is unknown. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Uh, the mosque. I meant the synagogue. Um, we, uh, there was a very interesting, I'm just going to show you a very quick video and then I want to just talk for one second after. Um, there was a very interesting experience when the Americans invaded Iraq, when they came to the security services of uh, building of Saddam Hussein, they found an endless series of Jewish documents of one variety or another that they had rounded up. And these were floating in a sea of water. And there were Talmuds and there were uh, report cards. There was all kinds of stuff from the Jewish community, which then, of course, completely gone. Um, the, uh, the soldiers didn't know what to do, so they got in touch 
ultimately the army got in touch with the American archives and they said, well, this is a huge collection of documents. What should we do? And so I'm going to show you a little video on describes what happened and then come back to what actually happened despite what I said in the video. These seem to be the only vestige of our history. We left so much behind. This is our heritage. This is our religion. It's our culture. It's something to really be proud of. When we got to Baghdad, my colleague and I went into where the books and documents had been placed. And mold smell just, a, just hit you in the face. And we could see that everything was in quite bad condition. So there was a lot of damage that had occurred. The material was confiscated from the Jewish community starting in 1975 when two intelligence officers came to the center for the Jewish community in Baghdad and decided to confiscate whatever they found there. The most important part were sermons given by rabbis of the Iraqi Jewish community in the 19th century. The oldest among them goes back to 1568. The preservation process involves stabilizing the books and documents. First step was to remove the mold so that they could be handled. And from there, each one was assessed to figure out, OK, what are we going to do? And we needed to make it stable enough that it could be handled. Many things had to be repaired also. Few things were fully treated and were washed and re-sewn and made into new bindings. Among the material that were found were Torah scrolls and Megillat Esther. Their letters were wiped out. They were torn apart. Because of their holiness, we treat them the way we, tr we treat regular Torah scrolls with best of respect. This is in compliance with the commandment, Lo tisa et shem Adonai Elohecha l'ashau. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Therefore, prayer books which are no longer usable are not trashed or burned, but are buried in the consecrated ground of a Jewish cemetery. Iraq would like to make a statement to the world that the Jews were an important part of the Baghdad history, and we would like to preserve that. We would like to cherish that history and pay our full respect to that. It's a very 
moving day to see some vestige of our grandparents and parents and, and great forefathers all being buried because it's ruined now. There was a time when it was thriving. They studied from it and they prayed from it. It's not at all a happy day. Um, it's a very uh, emotional day. It brings out all the hurt we went through. It brings out all the feelings of rejection, the feelings of being denied our rights, the feeling of being denied our heritage and our religion. <laughs> And the practice of our religion, I mean, we were scared. At least we have it. At least it's here. At least it's buried somewhere where it will not be desecrated. And that's what we are afraid of. You don't know in whose hands they'll fall. It's a very momentous uh, day today. And it was worth coming all the way here for that. The Iraqi ambassador from uh, from uh, had come up from Washington for the event, and he said to us, he said an interesting thing. He said, "I'm a Kurd. I'm Kurdish, so I understand. I understand what it means in the context of Iraq to be discriminated against." And he went on to say, "You heard him say it here, that the government's Iraq's policy now would be to celebrate the Jewish heritage of Iraq." And he said, and I quote, would like to preserve and cherish its Jewish history. Of course, since the burial of those scrolls, nothing like that has happened in Iraq. In fact, to the contrary, what's actually happened in Iraq is in the passage of uh, more anti-Semitic laws uh, just, uh, just last year. Um, so as I say, I think this, is, this would be a sea change for the Arab countries that uh, expelled um, their Jews uh, to actually engage in this form of truth and reconciliation, to actually create commissions so that all of their citizens could understand what happened. My own sense is that uh, one good way of beginning that process would be actually for the state of Israel to say, we too will do that. We too will do that. We'll set up a truth commission that will document exactly what happened to the Palestinians, and we want you as well to do the same thing. There's a little quote in the book, I think you all know who Erwin Kotler is. Erwin Kotler was Mandela's lawyer. He was, in fact, I think it's fair to say one of the most distinguished human rights lawyers. Who was, he was also the Minister of, the Minister of Justice in the government of Canada. And uh, he has done extensive work um, uh, what happened with respect to the expulsion of the Sephardic Jews and the international uh, law surrounding uh, those expulsions. But he says a lovely thing, which I think is right. He says, the let there be no doubt about it. Where there is no remembrance, there is no truth. Where there is no truth, there will be no justice. Where there is no justice, there will be no reconciliation, and when there is no reconciliation, there will be no peace. Um, I just close by saying I think that one of the things that Henry and I, you know, um, wanted to do with this book is create a sort of simple um, account that anybody could read in simple language of what it was that happened. So, as a contribution not just memory, 
but a, as a contribution to the truth. So thank you very much. Rich and I will take questions. Do you have all the questions? Do we have time? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any possible reason why nothing has been done to acknowledge the issue? Could it be that maybe uh, Jews from Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria immediately were granted French nationality? So it's kind of deleted the problem. Like if you can go to Palestinian mm -hmm. refugees in Lebanon, or completely ostracized and kind of people get a job. Mm -hmm. they, they are kept in a situation of refugees. So could this be one of the reasons why these this problem is uh, I think those I think the number of reasons that Henry can jump in on. Uh, <clears throat> one is that the uh, the situation of the Palestinians was uh, you know they when the Palestinians were displaced whether they fled or whether they were pushed out or whatever but in any event when they left their homes um, the Arab governments declined to take them in because what they wanted them to be was as a kind of sore uh, that would be visible uh, permanent and uh, that's what they became uh, what happened in terms of the um, the Jews was a completely different thing. I mean, uh, Israel, which was then a very small and very poor country, took in enormous quantities of people. Uh, in the case of uh, in the case of the Algerian Jews, and in fact the, the other French-speaking Jews, well, in Algeria, uh, in 1870, under the so-called Crimea Decree, um, the French government made it clear that all the French settlers, the Pinoir, were in fact obviously French citizens. And they extended French citizenship to the Jews, but not to the Muslims. So that when the Algerian, uh, the War of Independence took place, all the Jews simply packed up and moved to Paris. Um, and the other countries, whether it was Canada, whether it was the UK, whether it was uh, the United States of America, <clears throat> took all these people in. So the relative visibility of the suffering of the refugee was mitigated, I think, by the fact that they were taken in. Um, the Arab countries made it their business to keep a spotlight on the Palestinian issue continuously. That's what I said is 800 resolutions in the United Nations, all of which talk about these, uh, the situation uh, between uh, Israel and, uh, and the Arab countries. Not a single mention of the expulsion of the Sephardi Jews, but endless conversation about the Palestinians. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, it remains to me a mystery. And when Henry actually approached me to give a little hand to um, help out with this project and the creation of the archive that he talked about, I frankly had to admit, I had never heard of this in my life. And it is astonishing to me, it remains astonishing. I don't know whether my reasoning is right as to why people don't know about it, but it remains astonishing to me that this gigantic displacement, this huge exercise in ethnic cleansing could have taken place and nobody knows about it. Even when you talk to European Jews, they don't know about it. It's remarkable. I mean, you should talk to this, and you know more about this than I do. Well, you know, part of it also had to do with Israel. Um, the idea with the founding of the state was that um, you would make Aliyah and that you would be able to be part of a, a new, new beginning. And so Israel very much wanted a lead. They needed them to come in. And it made a very big difference where you came from. If you came from Casablanca, or if you came from the Atlas Mountains, and there was an enormous amount of institutional discrimination against the Sardi when they came here. Amazing what happened in Mabarot when they sent them to uh, the development towns of the Shimon and Demona or whatever. And so you had the sense of belonging when you came but on the other hand, you had the sense of Ashkenization. You wanted to make them into something different. But what's happened over time is that we're now two, three generations later. This is not the issue anymore. The issue becomes one today in Israel of much more identity politics, much more one of, um, uh, of, of 
uh, appreciating the multicultural heritage. But, and we have, starting in 215, um, uh, an annual commemorative day called Yom Haplidim. Do you know about Yom Haplidim? No, okay, here's a perfect example. This is a perfect example. So we have Yom HaShoah, which you know, right? Mm -hmm. And here in 215, the Knesset passed legislation that every year on November 30th, we would commemorate and celebrate the Plitim that left Arab lands. How come Israelis don't know about this? Asked by the Knesset. And this, I was talking to Margalit earlier and Miriam about this before, where how come our textbooks in our schools, how come our kids in schools in Israel are not learning this? But what has happened is that in the second and third generation, there has been a very different understanding in terms of the experience of these plea team that came here. But this is not the, the situation in the Arab world. In the Arab world, what happened was that you developed UNRWA, which is a United Nations organization that basically says that you will be a refugee forever because it's the only um, population in which even if you're a citizen of another country, you're still a refugee. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, so you come to Canada, you go to France, and you're French, you're Canadian, your children are, your grandchildren are, and you're still considered a refugee. And so you know, what's happened is that there's a very different kind of experience. In Israel, they were accepted, they had problems, and integration has happened in different kinds of ways. Where in the Arab world with the refugees, the uh, United Nations and other nations have used it as a spotlight, which has turned into a geopolitical situation, which has been very detrimental to their, um, to their own human rights and development. But to the general, to the general question, can you answer? Henry's answer is interesting. It's basically Israel didn't, who, who, and Israel took in 65, 70% of these people. Even Israel did not shine a spotlight on what had happened. As Henry was saying, the Ampli team is two years old now, five years old, uh, 215. There you go. Anyhow, Marguerite? Okay, well, I have a comment and a question. Hmm. The government is from the all history theories. The memory is changing. I mean, the same people, if you would, uh, would uh, interview them 40 or 60 years ago, they give probably a different uh, story. And also, memory is manipulated, as you, which I've, you've shown very clearly, by the uh, about the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. but I suppose that also Israel has been manipulating the memories of the Jews from our country. So this is what we believe that was in the account. Murray, let me comment on this. So I use the word hermeneutics, which is it's continual being reinterpreted all the time. As the theorists think out what is oral history. And on the <laughs> other hand, how our politicians and the the uh and 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 the um generations as they go through reinterpret so it's i use the word fluid always changing and probably this world has not been clever enough or to use this uh, very strong uh, argument of the team uh, but my question is uh, more about the stories that you heard did you feel that people coming from Canada, United States, France, in, uh, with them, uh, had a different perspective or they remember differently? Or in other words, what was the impact of the place where people were interviewed? Well, the, the, the difference would be enormous in the sense that, as Henry was saying, when uh, the refugees arrived in Israel, they were treated very badly. I mean, they had a horrible experience. You know, whether, whether it was in the Mabarata or just plain prejudice, you know, and they were regarded as being sort of uh, second rate and 
they were regarded as being Arabs. And of course, you know, the <laughs> Israel had just fought a war against the Arabs. And so were they fifth columnists? Were they somehow or another, you know, not real Jews, like the Jews who had founded Israel? This was a very, very difficult set of circumstances. Whereas the, the Algerian Jews who came to France were already French citizens. So they might have found it difficult as every refugee does to come to another country, but at the very least, they spoke the language, they'd been educated in French, they held French citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the difference in terms of how you're received in a country, um, whether you're received in France or in Canada, many came to Canada because they thought that's fine, we can speak French, uh, would, be, would have been a completely different set of experiences from the experiences that people would have had when they came to Israel. And I, I'm not sure that, I mean, I know I, I live here. Does that sound right? A, I think that today there is more legitimacy to speak against the Ashkenazi hegemony. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this also distorted in a way the, right. the memories. I, and I'm not sure that in the other countries they went through this um, process that lets them speak so much against because in most of these countries, there were also local Jews, and sometimes the, the majority who were Ashkenazi or French, you know. So I'm not, I, I, I'm, I think this needs more further mm -hmm. uh, uh, analysis. So let me, let me comment on it in a different kind of way. You cannot look at the Pleitean who came from the Atlantic to the Tigris Euphrates with the same lens. The Iraqi experience is very different than broad. Mm. Okay. I think it's the same thing that you have just commented on. It's very different if you went to France as an Algerian citizen, or if you came from yeah, Lebanon, or if you came, you know, speaking French, or if you came from Morocco as a member of a colony, or if you went to Canada, let's say, um, or if you went uh, as an Iraqi to the UK, or if you went to New York. And so uh, what you're saying, I think is very, very valid and takes research because the comparative perspective is extremely important. It's not monolithic. And if one can look at these different countries, if one has enough interviews, as it were, in order to create some um, uh, cumulative data in order to do these kinds of comparisons, I think you would have incredible insights and it would not just be black and white. There'd be a lot of texture. And one then could look at that in a comparison to, for example, those that went to Israel because the uh, uh, situation of the Yemenites who went to Rehoboth or the Iraqis who went to Or Yehuda or whatever, you know, it's not the same. They're very different experiences. And I, I think what you're saying is 100% right. And that I think is the, the, the value of uh, our collection in part, because we're doing mostly chutzlar, it's outside of Israel. And so you're going to be able to have primary resources that you're gonna be able to uh, mine in order to see this comparison. Let's take a question from Zoom for someone. Sure, sure, sure. I don't think so. Can you read it? Or they no, they read it. They just offer them to. It's a chat. It's a chat. No. Okay. Okay. So you can uh, read it. Uh, what is? The no, no, there is nothing. It's just. Uh, oh, 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 oh just a uh, invitation. Yeah. Invitation. Okay. I have another question. What? Yeah, I was wondering. You know, maybe one of the reasons why the issue is not addressed is that there were no clash groups or NGOs. That's why it was organized to exert pressure on governments and to make their voice heard. Are there any NGOs you know that would exert some pressure? It's, it's not true. The spy were organized for the creation of the state and during the creation of the state. It's, it's, you need to check what, what you mean by organization of this. Because I, 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 don't, I haven't heard about any you know, organization. I, not it's that not I am. Expert. I, I am. Uh, no, I, I tend to, to agree with the say uh, it needs uh, one crazy man to, to create a, a successful startup. So maybe there was no such a crazy man enough over there to, you know, to lead it up. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the issue in my eyes. 
you know, the way I see today, stories of Ashkenaz being more yeah, number wise, there, there were more here as well. But for me, it doesn't play a, a nothing. It, it, they just didn't have an answer, okay? They didn't have a, a, a and that's it to, to this subject. Take the issue and put it in the headlines and make a big deal of it. So in terms of the history, there are all kinds of little organizations that are around and they try to develop ethnic parties already when Israel was uh, founded. Um, but what we hear about is Shas, you know, later on in the 80s. But you with the first sort of organization that really had some um, Oomph to it was the World Organization of Iraqi Jews that developed in the 70s. And it's the 70s, okay? And then uh, you have um, an organization, organization about 20 years ago called JJAC, Justice from Jews from Arab Countries. And they became sort of the, uh, the patriarch of a number of other organizations. Uh, one's called Harif, which is in London. Another one's called Jemena, Jews. Um, uh, Jimena, Jews indigenous to uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, Sephardi voice that sort of grew out of uh, a totally different uh, um, development because uh, I'm, I'm an academic. These were all political organizations. But you also have to see what's happening in Israel politically. Israel did not want to address the Palestinian issue post 1967. So therefore, they didn't want to address the issue of the Tlipi. Only with the Oslo Accords and then Rabin and then reaching out did they begin to try to look at it in a different kind of way. And then you had the Clinton Accords that failed. And so it's really after that in the last 20 years, but the geopolitical scene has changed and Israel has changed. So, um, to your comment, it's really only been in the last generation that these organizations, NGO, et cetera, has begun to have a voice. And out of that has come Yom Hapni team. Now, let me just put this in perspective so you understand. This is not unique. I went to Jewish school in the 50s and 60s in Canada. David went to Jewish schools. We did not learn about the Holocaust. We knew that there was the Holocaust, but there, no, no, you never had. The reason that the Holocaust began to be big was Elie Wiesel wrote a book called Night. That's when it started to be big, okay? When did interviews start being collected? Not with Elie Wiesel, it was when Spielberg did Schindler's List, 50 years later, okay? So- You're talking about one person, right? Right, right, okay? So you had Elie Wiesel and, and then you took Schindler. So in one sense, if you put that in a kind of comparative perspective, and these are the Ashkenazi. So for the Sephardi from 1950 to 2000, it's not that much different. It's incredible because I went to school also in Canada, also Jewish school. When did you learn about the Sephardi? In terms of the Holocaust. When did you learn about the ethnic cleansing in Morocco and Iraq and all these places? Again, a lot of this, either not very much or in not a lot of detail or when I'm not. That's the presence is one of her, the research. I, 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 I have Uh, and Ashi, <laughs> Ashi in school, who taught me, like, like, no, no religious school, who taught me about the Rabbi Yudan, nobody, and he's a great man, he made the Mishnah, right, but nobody talks about him mm -hmm. in school. So in my school,
No, but I think that it, but it's, as a broader thing, you could talk to almost anybody in that reads the newspapers in any country, and they would know about the Palestinians. They would know about the Palestinians. Almost nobody in any country knows about the uh, Safari. And that's the fascinating thing. I should make about you know the history so, so here's the question for you yes you learned about the Sparty. did you learn anything after 1492 yes so you would know something about Iraqi Jews in 1930 40 50 maybe at this point it's a So, Mark, your, your memory has changed. You see, your memory <laughs> no, has changed. No, so well, I just I, interviewed her at 15. Well, and I interviewed her now. I've learned more. I've learned more. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for us to ask in the chat. So, mm. yeah. yes. Henry, in a vacuum of multi ethnic education in the Jewish and Israeli world, how do you think this paradigm of Sephardic voices and Jews from Arab and Islamic countries can be part of a more universalistic narrative? <laughs> well, I, I see it actually very simply. The Holocaust, in terms of our understanding, changed dramatically after Elie Wiesel did night. A generation later, we have the Holocaust Museum in Washington. A generation later, we have the Holocaust Arm, which is a monument in Miami, the second most visited Holocaust um, 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 memorial in the United States. So I'm optimistic. I think that Sparty Voices, the work that Margalit does, the work that Bang Sadun does, all these people, that if we're able to bring to the table these stories, if they can go into our curriculum, if they can go into the textbook, it's a generation from now that we will begin to see the changes. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take time. But it takes people like us who are in this room to do the research in order to be able to begin to make the changes. Spoken like an academic. I tell, I, I'm going to give you something. <laughs> yeah. I'm not an academic. My background is in media. And uh, I think that all the academics, if you, if you actually really want to engage people in a conversation about human rights, then obviously you need to know what you're talking about. But beyond that, you have to know how to talk to people. This is not... People get confused about this. This is a Jewish story, sure, but this is a human rights story. This is a story that is an extraordinarily important human rights story. And if you want it known, that it gets known because you write simple books, not academic texts. It gets known because you make movies about it. It gets known because you distribute these movies and these simple books all around the place. You know, there, there's lots of research, but the, the thing that strikes me is how little discussion there is. We've been putting a lot of, uh, you'll see over the course of the next little while, we've been making an effort to actually raise this issue in the press. So there'll be this article in the, the Jerusalem Post, there's an article in Media Line, there'll be another big article. Yeah, for yeah. Uh, you know, while we're here, we've been trying to do the same thing in other places. But I think that this, this only works if there's two sides to the problem. One is, as Henry says, more research. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but the other is to actually have a concerted effort to let people know what this is in a way that they can easily understand, whether it's digital, whether it's simple print, whether it's movies, whatever it happens. Can I say something? Mm. Last comment. Answer which as was, I agree with I mean, the academic view of uh, Henry. I, what, what I, I think what is important 
is to record the memories. Sure. How they are interpreted, what people uh, in 30 years from now will understand, how they, this is all not in our hands, but the, the most important thing is before these people die, to record their memories. And I think that this is the most important thing that survived was in the Whether that is so. Thank you, David. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. I, I didn't realize that you are one of the co um, uh, editor of the book and you're going to present also today. So, my apologies. All right. And um, thank you all for this event and for our activities. Yeah, let's be at the center of the patient. Thank you. Thank you.